Hello, everyone. Five years ago, I started something with a community of really brilliant people that would help us understand better how the world works. It started me on a journey that has been incredibly rewarding, but also really surprising. Some things that happened I would have never have imagined. What you see behind me is the edition of Wired magazine that was curated by President Barack Obama. And our community, and the champion of our community, featured under Future Technology Frontiers. And I never imagined that uh, Joy Ito of the MIT Media Lab would send a team over to work with us and make a documentary about it. And I most certainly wouldn't imagine that I would be standing here at the moment representing women innovators as the current European Woman Innovator of the Year, because I just think of myself as an enabler. I just enable a community of around 5,000 or so innovators to push at the boundaries of what innovation can be. And what we have discovered is that we can radically change the way that innovation is managed. We have managed to bolt on disruptive innovation safely on top of current industry capabilities. Now, innovation is a funny thing. Uh, in 1950, the Sainsbury family opened the first self-service supermarket in Croydon in London. And this idea was such a novel thing for the people of Croydon that the company had to issue a statement that said something on the lines of, no, really, it's okay. You can take the goods from the shelves yourselves and nobody will think you are stealing. Of course, if you had asked any group of consumers at that time, should we turn a warehouse into a store, they would have said, no, we want service. If in 2005 you had asked anyone, should we remove all of the buttons of a mobile phone, they would have said, no, that'd be awful. But of course, what these businesses are really good at, and the reason why they have survived, is not because you could take things off the shelves yourself or because you can stab at the screen with your finger. It's because they have allowed a huge amount of other products and services to be part of their idea. They became enablers. None of you would ever turn off your electricity supply in your home, even though it's a product, a product that you pay for. And that's because it's just too useful. It just enables too many useful things. And of course, when it was first harvested by the likes of Tesla and Edison for new kinds of products, it was so radically transformative that I now, I now call it a meta-technology, an enabler at the grand scale. Just harnessing electromagnetism, for instance, has engendered all sorts of new industries like broadcasting and recording and communications and um, this little dinky format that you're all probably familiar with, which still dictates the length of all of your pop tracks today. Now, um, it also, of course, enabled the Internet. And the Internet is another hugely enabling platform, and of course, it allows you to develop all sorts of ideas, mainly on screen these days, but that's just a transitional phase, and we'll come back to that later. Um, but the thing is that the more your technology is an enabler for other people's innovations, the less likely it is to become obsolete. So, for instance, e electricity today, in today's terminology, could be considered a platform. And there's never been a better time to allow other people to build on top of your ideas. We've gone from being consumers to users to adopters, testers of new technologies to being content creators. Every single person in this space is a content creator. You all upload content on a daily basis. And this is only likely to increase. In the last 100 years, we have automatized all of our daily chores, and we're doing more of this kind of thing with uh, robotics and AI, and we're freeing up more time to generate meaningful content, generate new knowledge, and build new ideas. People who build their ideas on top of yours have it in their interest that your product survives. For this reason, all of these enabling technologies that I just talked about they were hugely disruptive at that time, but now they're simply how the world works. So what I have been encouraging our community is to experiment with the way that the world works so that we can generate more of these enabling technologies and enable more ideas to happen. And what we ended up with is a toolkit, is an entire toolkit of enabling technologies, but I'll tell you more about that later. First, we had to solve a problem. Because what we had to do is bring all of these people from different disciplines into a space of common understanding, and that's really hard. It's hard because we have developed our language really beautifully to describe 
ever more complex com concepts. And this has kind of generated something that we to refer to as jargon. So you have these kind of cliques of people who can talk to each other beautifully about these complex concepts, and you haven't got a clue about what they're saying. And in fact, you don't understand what's so clever about it. Now, what we need to do is bring these guys in the room together with these other guys. In our, in our community, for instance, we have people who are specialists in artificial intelligence and neuroscience and blockchain technologies and data analytics and designers and critical thinkers. All of these guys have to come into a space where they can exchange knowledge. Because at the intersection of these uh, various um, areas of knowledge, some new knowledge can happen. And the first thing we have to do is change our starting point, change the way that we communicate. So not rely on the screen anymore, which is an old paradigm, bring the whole thing into the physical space. I now call it the physical internet because of this. And not in terms of nodes and synapses. If anybody's familiar with the internet of things, it's been modeled on this kind of mental model. More about the fuzzy spaces in between where culture and behavior and all of these different areas of knowledge intersect. In the physical space, we start using completely different ways to communicate in addition to speech. And this you will be familiar with if you've ever had to do a business deal because you wanted to be there in person. Because when you're there in person, there are so many other things that you infer from the communication that by writing and looking at the screen, you just simply won't be able to. And this area is not only uh, useful for us in terms of um, talking through the ubiquitous hack, lots of you may be familiar with the hackathon concept, which is basically a translation of thought into practice, a way of thinking out loud, the way that allows us to discuss with others through prototyping, so it eliminates the jargon. Not only that, there's more to it. There's gesture, there's signaling. And then there's the area of the limbic brain, which actually is responsible for decision-making and for um, build-up of trust, for instance. And it's influenced by things like music. On the left, it's Rani Da from Israel. On the right, it's Ahmad Bakri from the Palestine. These are our labs last year in Berlin. And these were the two people who were communicating via music. Music is our social glue. We put music at the center of this community in the physical space right from the beginning. And suddenly we witnessed small miracles of knowledge transfer where there hadn't been before. And what was extraordinary about it is that it opened up new kinds of channels of communication that we really hadn't experienced before and that hadn't been accessible before. What we realized was that through these new ways of communicating, we could really help people, not just through enabling them through technology, but through becoming something that's really extraordinary, through allowing them to be people that everybody could aspire to, to be truly great. This is Victoria Modesta. She's a bionic artist, she's a champion of accessibility and champion of new technologies. Our community, during our labs in Berlin, equipped her with all sorts of different bodily functions that would make her extraordinary and would make her someone we could aspire to. For instance, there was a team led by a fantastic designer, um, fashion tech designer, Anouk Wiprecht, who enabled her prosthetic leg to generate special effects for the stage. So, for instance, in this case, it was creating smoke for the stage, and it created an image that kind of reminds you of that famous picture of Marilyn Monroe, but a, with a completely new spin on it. And other teams worked with Victoria to enable her in other ways. So, they built a dress that was fitted with LED lights that changed color in response to neurofeedback. But what was really cool about it is that then Victoria could actually start to control the color of her dress by using her mind. And most of these um, ideas were built using the toolkit that we developed of enabling technology. So this is the riot board that was developed together with um, Aircam at the Centre Pompidou in Paris. It's one of our tangible user interfaces um, that uh, creates a connection between data from 
uh, air come and is embeddable in new types of products. And this was uh, this is this is this version here on the screen is one that was the very first one in January 2015. But when it was launched, it was a whole um, set of them were developed for the first creative test bed that we launched, and combined with other interfaces that allowed our crowd to generate a whole host of new products and new ideas. What happened was that these teams were able to communicate with engineers that authored this enabling interface. And they were able to feed knowledge back into the core IP. And the engineers were in turn able to add to their IP and further enhance the product. So it was a very much a two-way communication. But we created layers of intellectual property that allowed everybody to know exactly where someone else's intellectual property stopped and there started. This is Rojan Garipur being interviewed for um, the Ben Heck Show. He had built on top of the riot board with a set of um, ways in which you could physically interact with systems. At first with music systems, then with gaming, then we realized that you could completely replace the Kinect with his system and you would have more players. But I was really curious to find out what would happen if we took that system and ported it over into an area of industry that used heavy machinery. And so we created a prototype for the forestry and agriculture sector, which is completely separated from music and from gaming. And we ended up with a one and a half hour brainstorm session with a head of product of one of the biggest plants in the world of heavy machinery. And at the end of this brainstorming session, we realized that what we had developed was something that wasn't just making the product uh, interaction faster or better, but was actually adding safety, it was adding more modes of communication, it was making it cheaper, it was creating more ROI. So then we went to the biggest investors in the region and they immediately saw the potential of building something for a sector as big as that. And the distributor of componentry that wanted to scale the riot board immediately saw the potential of launching a new product with so many early adopters. So what happened was that industry came to us as a result of witnessing some of these things and decided to donate IP to our toolkit, which I think is probably unheard of. But it was so valuable to them. For instance, we ended up with having, uh, being able to use Philips Hue Lighting API and combine it with uh, sound to generate applications for health, for communications, um, for instance, generative light in response to data. This me meant that we were now creating a pool of IP that came from all sorts of sectors of industry, and this is something that we now refer to as the industry commons. And we're building this further because it's really valuable. It's not just plain research and development that creates assets you can then add to your core IP, but it's actually something that enables new markets and new market niches to develop. For instance, it takes your IP into some of the local communities that can then develop ideas that are meaningful to them um, and that solve problems that they know they have. And we really want to go there. We want to go there, even though it's risky, there are some unknowns, we're going to have to tackle issues of security and privacy very early. But we want to go there because one of these days, we want to be able to say, well, those enabling technologies that we've developed, well, they're just how the world works. Thank you very much.